<laughs> so when I was in college, um, I worked in IT. Isn't that shocking? Isn't that surprising? Does that surprise anybody? No. IT is information technology. I worked in computers, and I worked there for four years, um, which is how I learned a lot of the skills that actually translated really well into church ministry and setting up tech and all this stuff. But that's another story. Um, so when I worked in IT, we fixed a lot of different issues. We worked on computers. We worked on I. I iPhones, we worked at like removing viruses, hardware, software, everything. Basically, if a student or a teacher brought their machine to our desk, it was our responsibility to fix it. Like, just fix it. Sometimes they would literally say that. Like, they'd toss it on the desk and be like, just fix it, and then run, they'd run away. <laughs> and um, a lot of times, we were able to fix it, but sometimes we were not. Sometimes an issue would come to the desk that we were just like so overwhelmed with like, I don't even know what this computer, like it won't turn on at all. The hard drive is making this sound, like how do we fix that? The, the student is standing in front of me, in front of the desk, weeping, just deep, horrible tears about how my thesis is out there, my final thesis, it's four years of work on that thing, and I don't know how to save it to Google Drive, and I never did that, and so it's all on my hard drive, and it's making this <laughs> sound as it spins, and I'd stand in front of them and just be like, oh my God. <laughs> I don't think I can handle you right now, let alone your computer. <laughs> so there were some times where people would come to the desk with just these issues that we did not know how to fix. And so what we did in those moments is we turned to our boss, Jesse. This was our boss. <laughs> Isn't he just like an amazing man? <laughs> like those, that hair. <laughs> Uh, he was a really great guy. Um, he, was, um, he was just like a tech master. He actually started out in our position. So I was what was called a resident technology assistant. I lived in the dorms, and I helped students with their technology. He started as a student from the bottom, from my position, and worked his way up through the ranks till he was the director of IT for the university. Like, amazing. And he was just a really awesome guy to work for, um, a great teacher. And we would turn to him for our mistakes because there were, we would come to a point where we're just, like, panicking. Like, oh, Jesse, I have no idea what to do. Like, what do I do? Help us. Help us fix this. And some of the times, he would some of the times he would, he'd just say, okay, here, I'll take it. Here, give me, give me that. Let's see. All right, let's do this. All right, here, fix. There, there you go. Now give it to the student. Sometimes he would just come in, swoop in, like on a, I don't know, a griffin or something with his hair flowing in the wind, and, <laughs> and he would fix the problem. But sometimes he would not. Sometimes when we were faced with a really difficult problem that we felt we cannot fix this, he would take a step back, and he would say, well, what have you tried? What have you done so far? Walk me through the problem. And he would turn these moments that in that, like at that moment, it felt like disaster. I'm not ready to fix this. I can't fix this. And he would turn them into teaching moments. And he would walk us through the problem, and he would walk us through fixing the problem so that we would mature so that we would grow in our skill set, so that we would become better technicians. How many of you have ever had a mentor like that? Who didn't just fix something for you. Maybe it was a parent, maybe you're in a trade or something. They didn't just fix it for you, but instead they spoke into your life and they actually let you take the lead so that you can grow, so that you can mature. That's actually a really important part of teaching. And that's a really important part of our personal growth you know, in the workforce, in our lives, your parents probably did it to you at some point, but also in our faith. Also in our faith. He'd always be there. You know, he'd always be standing behind us with that gentle, you know, he'd be glowing with his hair, you know. He just, so the, we felt his presence behind us. Um, he was always there to guide us, to keep us from trouble, but he let us take the lead. And so today... We're looking at the story of Moses and the Israelites. And we've been, in a, we've been in this series called Courageous Faith, all about men and women who walked by faith and not by sight. And so today we're looking at Moses and the Israelites. 
and how when they were in a truly desperate situation, I cannot fix this. And they wanted God to just fix it. Just take it away. Please just take, just fix this, God. God let them take the lead. God let them take the lead. So turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus is the second book in the Bible right after Genesis. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. 13, verse 17. So last week, Pastor, uh, the last couple of weeks, Pastor Garen and Judith, we've been in the story of Moses, and they've been teaching us through the story of Moses how the Israelites, God's chosen people, they were enslaved by Egypt for over 400 years. God's chosen race, these people who were supposed to basically inherit everything that God had for them, were enslaved by this other people group. And they were t- terrible taskmasters, forcing them to work just grueling hours of work. They were enslaved. However, God raised up a deliverer, Moses to deliver them from this awful land of Egypt all the way to the promised land, to the land that would be called Israel, the land that was promised to them, was promised to their forefather Abraham years before this. Moses was going to deliver them to there. And so Moses has an encounter with God, like Judith talked about last week. He encounters God in the burning bush, and God tells Moses, he says, you need to go up to Pharaoh and tell him, you know, like Val Kilmer in the animated movie, let my people go. And then Pharaoh says, no. And then so God sends 10 plagues upon Egypt, 10 horrible, devastating plagues upon Egypt, until finally Pharaoh relents, and he lets the people of Israel go lets them leave. And it says that when they were leaving, there were 600,000 fighting men. That's just the fighting men. That's not counting the children. That's not fighting the old men. That's not counting the women. 600,000. That means there were millions of them leaving Egypt at this time. And this is where we pick up the story. Exodus 13, verse 17. It says... When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory. And that's very interesting. God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness towards the Red Sea. Thus, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. Can you say that? Can you say like an army ready for battle? And I find that so, so interesting Because the Bible literally says they left Egypt, 600,000 men, millions of, of Israelites. They left Egypt like an army ready for battle. They were prepped. And as we learned in the past couple of weeks, the Israelites, they were not a weak race. They were a very strong people. They were a hardy people. And there were so many of them. There were were so many of them, they were so strong that the Egyptians were afraid of them. That as they grew and developed within Egypt, the Egyptians were like, we got to do something. We got to work these guys to the bone just so they don't have enough strength to overthrow us. This was an army that rivaled and would top the most mighty nation in the world, they thought at that time, which was Egypt. This was them. And so I find it very interesting that the Bible says they left Egypt like an army ready for battle, and yet God led them in a roundabout way so they would avoid battle, so that they would avoid fighting the Philistines. And if we look at the map, you can see this pretty clearly. Sorry, I'll do my best. I wish I brought a laser pointer. So Egypt is all the way on the left, and Israel is in the upper right-hand corner. All you would have to do is scoot east, go straight over, and you would be in the promised land, but you would run into these warring tribes, the Philistines. But instead of going that way, God led them all the way down. Notice, what is south of there? It's just water. 
You're not going anywhere. This isn't like a shortcut. This is, this is literally like the most roundabout way you could go. He led them down south really far, all the way up to the Red Sea. And I just find that so interesting that God led them that way when they were ready. And I think the reason is that even though the Israelites were ready, they didn't feel ready. They lacked the confidence leaving Egypt to fight a a great battle, even though they were very capable of doing it and winning. And so many times, I believe, I know, you are ready for what God has for you. You just don't feel ready. You lack the confidence to move forward, to take steps of faith, to follow in what God is telling you because you feel like you, you, feel like you can't. But as I said a couple of weeks ago, the heart is deceptive above all things. The heart lies to you. Your feelings lie to you. And so you might very well be ready for this next challenge that God is putting in your life. God is telling you to go somewhere. God is telling you to talk to somebody. God is telling you to pick up a new ministry. I'm speaking to all of you right now and saying you are ready. You are ready. It's just your feelings are telling you you're not. But God says you are. You are ready. And I think this is amazing because it shows how gracious God is, this whole situation. God is gracious because he also meets you where you're at. He meets you where you're at, and sometimes he provides an out for you. Sometimes he provides an out. Like I remember when we were working the tech desk, like I said before, sometimes we would come to Jesse with a problem, and even though we were ready, even though we had the skills to fix it, Jesse would come in, because we know we're like in a panic. We're like, I can't do this, Jesse. I don't know what to do. Like, what do we do? He would come in. And he would put our, his hand on his, our shoulder and be like, it's all right. I got this. Take a break in the back. You know, like, t- like calm down. <laughs> like, it's okay. I got this. And that's grace. That's grace. That's what God is showing Isra- the Israelites here. But is, it is not the best for them. You know, if, you know what I mean? Like, God is helping them in the moment, but it's not, they're not realizing their true potential. They are not being raised up into maturity. They are not growing. They are not learning. They're kind of remaining immature. They're remaining stagnant. And sometimes that's okay. God chooses to do that. He says, You're, you are ready, but I'm going to give you some grace now because God cares about your feelings. God cares about you right now. He cares about what you're going through at the moment. And so sometimes he will provide an out, even if it keeps you at the same maturity level for a little bit. For a little bit. So the story continues, Exodus 13, verse 21. And it says, 13, verse 21. The Lord went ahead of them. So as they're going through the wilderness, the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. God led them step by step because he knew right then at their current level of maturity their current level of spiritual maturity, that they were lacking confidence. And I believe they were lacking faith. Because as we've read in Hebrews, Hebrews 1 says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. So faith is walking. It's walking by faith and not by sight. It's moving forward even when you can't see what's going on right in front of you. And so what does God provide for the Israelites? He provides for them this huge pillar of cloud and smoke that they can see at all times because their faith was lacking. They needed something tangible. They needed something they could see at all times. Notice how it changed. It changed so it was always visible. 
It was cloud during the day, and it was a glowing pillar of fire at night because they needed that. They needed that in their current level of maturity. And that's another image of just God's tremendous grace. Did God have to come to them in a pillar of fire? No. But they needed something to follow in that moment. That's grace. God meets you where you're at. But he doesn't leave you there. He meets you where you're at. He meets you at your current level of maturity. But he will eventually push you forward. Because he's not the kind of God who allows us to stay immature in our faith, to stay immature in our spirituality. He wants us to grow grow into a relationship with him, grow into a relationship with each other too. He wants us to become powerful men and women of God. And so sometimes, though it's so much easier for us to walk in immaturity, God will give us a push, a push into maturity. And I'll tell you what's about to happen next. The Israelites got a push. The Israelites got a push. <laughs> Exodus 14, verse 5. So everything's going good. They're going kind of in a roundabout way through the wilderness. Everything's fine. Everything's dandy. But then, verse 5, when word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled Pharaoh, that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. Uh Uh-oh. What have we done, they said, letting all those Israelite slaves get away? These are millions of people, millions of slaves, free labor. We just let them go. What have we done letting them all get away? So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots. These were war machines. These weren't like a little wagon. Okay, these were war machines along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its own commander. Each with its own commander. And I skipped ahead. First, skip down to verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up. Can you imagine? They're like sitting around eating like their pita or whatever it is. They're like (laughs) sitting around and they like look, they like look up like, (gasps) and there's just a cloud of smoke that's different from the cloud of smoke they're following. And then they just see these chariots, you know, That'd be terrifying. That'd be so scary. They looked up. They looked up and they saw them. They saw the Egyptians overtaking them and they cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us here into the wilderness to die? Such drama. Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen? Like they knew this would happen. Didn't didn't we tell you this would happen when we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. These people are so dramatic. The melodrama of these Israelites, are just it's just crazy to me. Totally crazy to me. So the people are terrified. They have no idea how to solve this problem. They don't know how to fix it. They were trapped. They've got Egypt behind them. And what's in front of them? Where did God lead them? To the Red Sea. They led them to a, led them to a body of water. They didn't have any boats. Like, what are they going to do? They were trapped. They had nowhere left to go. So they turned to their leaders They cried out to God, and they complained to Moses, which becomes a pattern. They said, help us. Fix this, Jesse. Fix this. Fix this problem. And so Moses gives some pretty good advice. Verse 13. So Moses, you know, he responds to the people, and he says, don't be afraid. Just stand still. And watch the Lord rescue today, rescue you today. Just stand still. Don't do anything. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Just chill. Just stand still and watch. And on the surface, 
That seems like pretty good advice. I'll admit I've probably given that advice to some of you before. I've probably given that advice to myself. Just chill, calm down, everything will work fine. The Lord will take care of the problem. Who will wipe it away? And he does sometimes. He does sometimes. Just stand there, don't do anything, and watch the Lord work. Because God meets us where we're at, right? He meets us where we're at. You let, do you lack confidence? I'm going to bring you in a roundabout way through the wilderness. Do you lack faith? I'm going to set up a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke in front of you, you so you can always see me at all times. But here's the problem with that mentality. It assumes that God leaves you at your current level of maturity. And he does not. That is not God's prerogative. God wants you to grow. God wants you to mature. God meets you where you're at, but he does not leave you there. And then he does something just incredible. Verse 15 says, Then the Lord says to Moses, so Moses had just finished telling all the Israelites, All right, everyone, just stand still. Just stand still, everyone. Watch and see what the Lord does. He's going to do something amazing. You don't have to do anything. But then the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Why are you looking at me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. And when my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. You see, it was not enough for Israel to stand there and watch. It wasn't enough for God. God said, nope, not good enough. He wanted them to be a part of what was happening. He was calling them to a deeper maturity. He was calling them to a deeper action. And he said, you need to move. And it's so easy sometimes in our own faith when what we've been doing for so long, it's been working. We've just been standing still, letting God do his thing. Letting God, maybe, letting God almost cater to our immaturity. Not truly, but it feels like that sometimes. It's so easy to stay where you're at spiritually, but God wants you to move forward. To deeper faith, he says, I will do my part, but you will do yours. You will do yours. We partner with God. The Bible says we are his hands and feet. We do the work. We do the will of God. That's why it's never enough to just come to church on Sunday and receive. We go out into the world and do his work. Do his great work for him. We partner with him. And as if that wasn't enough, here's what God does next. Verse 19, then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud, the thing, that thing that they've been looking at the entire time, the thing they've been focusing on, we just have to follow the pillar, we just have to follow the pillar, we just have to follow the pillar. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. What was in front moved to behind the clouds settled between the Egyptian and the Israelites' camps. That thing they looked to, that they had all that put their faith in, it moved behind them. Because he wanted them to walk by faith and not by sight. Sometimes God's purpose is to lead you to show you every step of the way, to gently guide you. Come on, come this way, do this thing. It's okay, come on, yeah, it's all right, let's go. God does that. That's his gentle, loving nature. 
But sometimes, other times, God's purpose is to protect you while you take the lead, while he partners with you. And so that movement of the cloud of fire from the front of the, of the army all the way to the back, it said two things. Number one, I want you guys to take responsibility for the next stage of your journey. I want you guys to take a step of faith as I lead you through the next stage. But it also showed I am right here and I will protect you from these crazy wild Egyptians who are bearing down at you with their chariots. I will protect you from that. But you need to get moving. Many of us enter seasons of our life where it may feel like God's not present. Maybe you're going through something like that right now. Or in pre, maybe earlier in your life, you felt like it was so easy to see God. It felt like it was so easy for you to talk to God and have a conversation with him and he'd tell you what to do and you just do it and it was easy back then. But you've entered a stage, a season of your life where it feels like he's pulled back. It feels like you can't talk to him the way that you used to. Sometimes it feels like he's not even there. I've gone through that. I remember when I was in high school, I felt like I had just the best relationship with God ever. I talked to him, he talked to me, it was great. But as I grew in maturity and as I continued on in my faith, there were times when I was like, where are you, God? Where are you? Where have you gone? Because I talk to you and you don't answer. I'm going through such a hard time right now, and yet it's like you're not here. May I suggest to you that in those times, it's not that God's not there, but that he has moved his pillar out from in front of you to your rear, to be your rear guard so that you can start taking steps of faith, so that you can walk by faith and walk by sight to do what he has told you to do, to do what the God's word has instructed us to do for generations while he protects you from behind. That is walking in faith, walking in deep, courageous faith to be able to obey to be able to say, yes, God, I will keep walking. Even if you're not sure what the whole journey looks like. Because we've been, give, we've been commissioned. The only commission we need in this book has already been given to us. I have filled you with my spirit. Now go out into the world and make disciples. Share my gospel with the people. If that is the, to bring more people to Christ, if that is the only commission you get for the rest of your life, that's enough. We always seek God and we seek his face and we seek after a relationship and we seek his will in every aspect of our lives. But in the stages where he is, it seems like he is silent, maybe he is. It might not just be that you're not hearing well. God, between the Old and the New Testament was 400 years of silence. In those times, have the faith to keep looking ahead, knowing that God is behind you, to keep doing what you were supposed to do. Share the gospel. Spread it to your friends. Live a life of holiness and purity. Care for others. Care for the sick and the needy and the poor. Walk in faith. Don't look back. Hebrews 11, verse 29 says, It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea. Moses did what God asked. He lifted up his arms, and the sea was split in this tremendous act of God, this miracle that demonstrated God's glory. The sea, the sea split open. And the Israelites walked through on dry ground 
while the Egyptians, when they chased after them, God drowned them all, simultaneously saving his people and delivering them from the greatest, one of the greatest army in the world, defeating them and showing his supremacy. God did that, but they had to walk by faith. They had to take that journey, and that journey was not easy. Remember, there's millions of people. Have you ever tried to coordinate millions of people? I've tried to coordinate 10 people, and it's not easy. They coordinated, yeah, youth camp. We, <laughs> you, Jerry's like, yeah. Coordinating millions of people, and they had to walk through the Red Sea. I looked it up. That's like a four-hour journey. Could you take four hours of walking through the waves piled 30 feet high, and you're just wondering, like, how strong is our God? <laughs> like, is there, like, a limit? Like, we've been walking a long time. Is, like, God getting tired? Like, I don't know. I'm sure that tested their faith, but they did not look back because back behind them was worse. <laughs> you had the Egyptians coming after you. They kept going focused on the last thing that God told them, which was to move forward, get moving. And that is my prayer for you guys, that you will walk by faith, step by step, inch by inch, even if you don't see God right in front of you. He's always there. He's always with you, protecting you and guiding you. And you've always got his word. You've always got his word to tell you what to do. Take those faith steps. How many of you, like Israel, want to go through life by faith and not by sight? Yeah, me too. To come to a place of trusting God so deep that you're comfortable with him leading from the front or being your rear guard. Because he can be both. Isaiah 52, 12 says, for, you, the Lord, for the Lord your God will go ahead of you. Yes, the God of Israel will protect you from behind. He's a God of both, a front runner and a rear guard for your life. Why don't you all stand and let's pray. How many of you, and you can raise your hand, want to be led into a deeper level of maturity with the Lord? Yeah, that is a lot, and that's, I'm very surprised and very pleased. Praise the Lord. It's so easy to get stuck where we're at, to say, this is comfortable, I don't want to move, but God has something so much better for every single one of you. And so we're going to pray a prayer that may result in some hard times, <laughs> in God pushing us, in God bringing us forward into deeper maturity. But I promise you, he is always with you. Always. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask you to lead us, to guide us into a deeper level of maturity. Bring us into a deeper level of faith, Lord. We want to walk by faith and not by sight. When you say go, we go. When you say speak, we speak. When you say listen, we listen. We love you, Lord. And we trust that what you have for us is the best. Guide us all into deeper level of, levels of maturity and protect us from behind as we move forward. In Jesus' name. And I want you guys, because it's easy to just end with that, to say, God, help us be strong. God, help us be courageous. It's easy to do that. But I want us all to make a declaration today, to take that first step and declare that even if I don't feel ready, I am ready for whatever God has for me. Will you repeat after me? Say, I am ready even if I don't feel ready. I ready myself and I commit to act when he says act. 
I commit to speak when he says speak. I commit to go when he says go. And I commit to submit to my Lord even when I don't agree because I know your ways are higher than my ways. Amen. Amen. And now I just want to give anyone an opportunity. The first step of faith that you can take is to put your faith in Jesus, to, take, to put your trust in Jesus and make him your Lord, to make him your Savior, and say, I want to follow you. I want you to be the pillar that I follow through the wilderness, and I want you to be the pillar that protects me from behind. Is there anyone in this room, every eye is closed, every head is bowed, who say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to become a Christian. Would you raise your hand? Yeah, I see that hand and that hand. And if you're online, you can raise your hand to God too. Yeah, I see that hand. Great, well, here's how you do that. You turn from your sins and you turn to God and you let him lead, just like that pillar. Rowan, you repeat after me and then everyone in the room will, will join in to support you. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins. And I turn to you. And make you my Savior. I make you my Lord. And I commit to follow you all the days of my life, even if I can't see you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And yeah, all right. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, um, please fill it out on the, on the Connect card or you're making a recommitment to Jesus. Fill it out on the Connect card and uh, we would love to get in contact with you, help you along on your journey. Um, yeah, we love you guys here. And we are so excited to see how God is leading you and where God will lead you on this great journey that he has for you. All right, God bless. to pick up the connect cards um and we love you guys and we'll see you guys next sunday